Professor Ian Hunter. I'm trying to read out everybody's titles. Are you the Hatsopoulos Professor? Yes. He is the uh, Hatsopoulos Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Bioengineering here at MIT. Uh, I, I have to say that one of my most exciting experiences in first coming to MIT uh, five years ago was actually going into Ian's lab. Um, if you want to see information being used in all of the aspects, you should go check it out. But today he's going to talk to us about uh, work that's going on at the Bioinstrumentation Lab. I don't know if you know, but we had a big effort to start up a, a, a large bioinstrumentation program here. And that's where many of the techniques that people were talking about yesterday, from instrumentation and getting information in mechanical engineering, will probably have the greatest application over the next half century or so. So, thanks a lot, uh, Seth. So if we can have the uh, lights down a little bit in the front. So, what uh, I'm going to do is uh, talk about uh, really two areas that are going on in our laboratory. The development of biomimetic materials largely centered around uh, conducting polymers. And the other is to de the development of a uh, small uh, walking uh, autonomous robot called the Nano Walker. Uh, and you'll see how these two themes we hope to merge them in the next couple of years so that we'll be fabricating a nano walker out of the biomimetic materials. So uh, my co-authors are Sylvain Mattel, uh, John Madden, Peter Madden, and we have John Madden uh, here today. Next, please. So one of the objective, uh, objectives of our laboratory is to try and automate the process by which new materials are discovered be they new drugs or new interesting uh, superconducting materials, new actuator materials. And what we are working towards is the notion of having in the one instrument uh, technologies for synthesizing materials uh, as well as an analyzing their anisotropic material properties, be they electrical, thermal, mechanical, optical, acoustic, uh, chemical, and so on. Uh, all orchestrated by molecular and continuum modeling techniques and a, an objective rational approach to instrumentation design and modification of those designs and uh, modeling algorithms as a function of what is measured. Next. Now, <clears throat> what are the typical sort of operations you might be using uh, when working with new materials? Uh, typically, you'll have a material, you'll take it to perhaps a scanning tunneling microscope or an atomic force microscope. You might do some laser optical microscopy, measure mechanical impedance, electrical uh, impedance. Uh, you might do some 3D microfabrication, some nanofabrication, some, perhaps some Raman spectroscopy, and so on and so on. Uh, at the moment, these are all conceived of as separate instruments, and you would take a specimen from one instrument to the next. What we're working towards is the notion of having basically the one platform for implementing the, the, uh, this range of functionalities. And we're calling that platform the Nano Walker. And the Nano Walker uh, <coughs> will eventually be an autonomous device carrying its own uh, computer. Uh, it has a minimum of 12 degrees of freedom. And as you'll see shortly, uh, it's capable of nano-stepping. In fact, it can move uh, with uh, uh, sub-nanometer increments. But the idea is to use that as a platform uh, to implement these different tasks. And we're not conceiving of the one nano-walker implementing all of these, but rather uh, you would have a version of a nano-walker which would be acting as an atomic force microscope, another version for a micro-injection uh, and so on. Next. So this is the current size of the Nano Walker, and I have one uh, right here. Uh, we are in the process of uh, making them autonomous. Uh, in the videos you're about to see, you'll see a tether where we bring the energy uh, into the uh, uh, Nano Walker as well as the information to control it. Uh, but we're working very hard to try and make the device autonomous. Uh, without tethers. Next. Uh, there you just see it rotating. And uh, <coughs> you'll see here that we're able to get the nano walker to move uh, quite quickly. And bear in mind that here we have 
uh, steps that are down to sub nanometer level uh, if we wish. Here the steps are uh, many tens of nanometers up to hundreds of nanometers per step and we've been able to uh, make the steps uh, up to 4,000 per second. So we've been able to get these devices to move very rapidly. Next. Uh, now some of the functionalities that you can build in uh, are, for example, you can uh, use a micro laser to trap particles and conceivably use the nano walker to move those particles around. And if we can place the cursor on the one that's uh, now trapped, uh, so there's an infrared laser trapping that particle and we're able to move it around in three dimensions. So the nano walker is conceived of as not only being usable for uh, making uh, traditional sort of physical contact with a material, but here uh, we're exerting forces on uh, materials using um, photon momentum. Next. Here's an example of a version of the technology uh, that we're using in the nano walker prior to the nano walker's ability to move uh, with four legs. Uh, and here we're scanning in three dimensions over the surface of a, uh, a graphite uh, surface. And on your right, uh, we have an image that's one nanometer by one nanometer, and the step size there is 10 picometers. So you can uh, clearly see the individual atoms there. So the nano walker is capable of moving down with minimum motions of about uh, 10 picometers, and uh, it can move uh, up to about uh, a, a meter workspace. Next. <clears throat> now, when we look at the nano walker, we see really a very large difference between the way in which that device is fabricated versus the way in which nature fabricates its autonomous devices. And there you see a water flea, roughly a millimeter in size, and a single bacteria, uh, roughly one nanometer, one or, two nanom uh, one or two micrometers, I should say, in size. So what we have to ask ourselves is what is the main difference between the way in which we would fabricate uh, the nano walker as an engineering system versus the way in which uh, nature fabricates its systems. Next. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> on your left there, I have uh, some of the salient features of current engineering practice where we normally use low molecular weight materials such as copper, um, iron, aluminum, silicon and so on. Existing engineering systems are characterized by separate manufacture and assembly. Think of the notebook computers that I see around the room here, uh, the CPU, the various disks and actuators, uh, the case and display are all separately manufactured and then assembled. Uh, whereas in nature, uh, things are grown, they're co-fabricated. And of course, nature's materials are high molecular weight. Most engineering materials, uh, the material properties are isotropic. Thermal conductivity is much the same in all directions. Electrical uh, conductivity, pretty much the same in all directions. Uh, optical transmission, normally pretty much the same in all directions. Whereas Biological materials are normally highly anisotropic and it's very clear that nature uses those anisotropic material properties in fabricating uh, biological systems. And then the other thing that characterize, characterizes existing engineering systems is that if, for example, you create a microactuator such as a piezoelectric device, shape memory alloy actuator, magnetostrictive device, that's really a bulk material phenomena. Whereas if you look, for example, at muscle, uh, that is a mechanism down to the molecular level. It's literally a nano stepper, a molecular linear stepping motor, and it's a mechanism. It's no more a bulk material than, for example, an internal combustion engine might be considered a bulk material. So biological systems are really very different, and we have to ask ourselves, is it conceivable to fabricate biological uh, engineering systems using similar principles. Next. Now, <clears throat> this uh, particular taxonomy here is due to Seth Lloyd. Uh, and Seth was thinking, well, on the one hand, in living systems, we can say there's energy. And on the other hand, we've got energy. Uh, information on the one hand and energy on the other. And if we look at the various uh, things that biological systems do, well, they acquire information 
in the form of uh, vision and, and acoustics and touch and so on. And we acquire energy by drinking and, and so on. We store information, we store energy. Energy is largely stored in the form of ATP, very high energy density uh, chemical storage me mechanism. We transfer information via neurons, for example, and we tra transfer energy via uh, uh, blood vessels. We transform and generate, we compute, uh, and we also do that with, uh, with energy in that muscles convert stored chemical energy to mechanical output with surprisingly high efficiency. And of course we dispose of information and we dispose of energy. Next. So when we look at, at biomimetic systems, we can say, is it conceivable to create a class of materials from which we could create uh, intelligent systems with the ability to co-fabricate and grow and to have anisotropic material properties, but where the different subsystems could mimic uh, those in a biological system? That is to say, we want to be able to acquire information, acquire energy, store information, store energy, transfer transform and generate and dispose. And so what I, want, I want to talk about in the next few minutes are our and others' attempts to create a class of materials, biomimetic materials, biological-like materials, uh, uh, having uh, a good percentage of these characteristics here. I regard that until we have most of these characteristics here, we're not in a position to create a biomimetic, autonomous, intelligent uh, system, a, a, uh, a biological robot, if you like. Next. So here is uh, some of the activity going on in our lab in this area. Uh, we have work going on to create uh, powerful actuators out of uh, these uh, biomimetic materials we work with, and they're called conducting polymers. Uh, low bandwidth trans, uh, transistors, I'll talk about some very exciting work where we've uh, managed to transmit uh, not only information through this material, but also uh, significant amounts of energy. Uh, energy storage and sensors of various sorts and so on and so forth. So you can see a list in black there of what we're working on. In blue are obviously the uh, counterparts that you'll find in nature, and in red we have some of the caveats here in that the transistors at the moment are very slow and uh, some of the uh, acoustic devices have got low bandwidth and so on and so forth, so you have to think of this as early days in the development of this technology. Next. So basically this is just one example of one conducting polymer, but it can be uh, coaxed into various forms. And when, for example, it's in one of its forms, a 0% oxidation state, uh, its electrical conductivity is extraordinarily low. But it can be switched into another state, a 50% oxidation state, where the electrical conductivity can go up by as much as 10 or 11 orders of magnitude, uh, theoretically. Uh, so these are materials where their salient material properties, in this case, uh, electrical conductivity can be switched over an enormous range and furthermore that material property often can be very very different in different directions so for example you can make a wire of this material where the electrical conductivity in the polymer chain direction can be uh, enormous and in the other two orthogonal directions it can be extremely small next so we grow these materials uh, in the lab, electrochemically. Next. <clears throat> and here's an example of one of the applications of the technology. Uh, it turns out that if you strain the material, uh, you can uh, set it up to act as a strain gauge, a useful sensor for uh, many applications. Next. And here's just some results. And uh, we found that we've got... Uh, uh, moderately high gauge factors in the order of about five. Uh, so there's an example of a, rel of a, a sensitive uh, force or strain uh, transducer made out of these materials. 
Uh, what about uh, computation? Can we create a transistor out of these materials? Well, indeed, there's a long history at MIT of creating, uh, conducting polymer transistors. In the past, they were largely fabricated on silicon or uh, glass substrates. Uh, we've been building them on uh, entirely pretty much out of uh, polymers. And uh, they share characteristics with FETs in that we'll have um, a source, drain, a gate. Oh, usually these are four terminal devices. Next. And here's an example where we're uh, switching this uh, transistor from a, uh, a state in which it's conducting to a non-conducting state. And there you see we have not achieved the theoretical 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 11 fold change in resistivity as yet. Next. The switching times of these devices are governed by uh, different equations from traditional silicon-based uh, transistors. Next. And at the moment, uh, they're relatively slow. So if, for example, you fabricate these materials in bulk, the transistors only have a bandwidth of about 1 hertz. If you go down to about 50 nanometers, uh, 10 kilohertz has been achieved. And certainly, if you go down to uh, uh, thin molecular layers, uh, speeds of one megahertz are achievable. Now, so this is not a technology that would compete with silicon for raw speed, but when you think of it, the neurons in your own brain uh, have a relatively low bandwidth, and uh, yet they confer an advantage by virtue of the fact that you can fabricate them in 3D. Next. What about creating wires? Uh, it turns out that these materials uh, obey Ohm's law remarkably well over a wide range. So you can transmit information through them uh, next. But the question that we asked ourselves, was it uh, possible to transmit significant amount of energy uh, through these uh, conducting polymer wires? Now, typically when you design an electric motor and you're pushing it to the limit, you'll figure you can pump about 10 to the 7 amps per square meter through a, uh, a non-water-cooled electric motor. Here we're achieving uh, uh, basically a third of that. So we're within a third, basically, or within an order of magnitude of what you can push through copper. An interesting difference is that the density of copper is about eight times greater than these polymers. So in point of fact, we are equivalent via some measures, volumetric uh, measures, to uh, copper and silver at room temperature. The very interesting possibility is that theoretically, it's clear that we should be able to go way past this point. But we're very excited that we have now achieved very significant uh, energy densities through these materials. Next. Uh, and also, we've created supercapacitors uh, out of these materials. They have a low bandwidth, very low bandwidth, but we can uh, store uh, something in the order, we've achieved something in the order of 10 to the 5 farads per kilogram. That's orders and orders of magnitude greater than, for example, uh, a tantalum capacitor that n is normally regarded as, a, as uh, a high energy density capacitor. Next. Actuators. Uh, <clears throat> here, uh, we show the multi-layer configuration for the actuators. Uh, next. And uh, <clears throat> we're working with a variety of conducting polymer materials. And here's a very interesting one we started uh, to work with, calixarine, which holds the promise of achieving uh, large strains, much larger than we're achieving at the moment. Next. And uh, so far, uh, we've been walk working to push the uh, active strains, the contractions achieved by these materials up, as well as their bandwidth. Next and uh, also creating versions of it that can uh, operate in room temperature and in air. You'll notice that the voltages here are very small, so these are not like piezoelectric materials where you'd need to use uh, voltages in the uh, hundreds of volt range. Uh, we can get these thing to, things to contract actually with less than one volt. Next. And bandwidths are also somewhat equivalent to what you would find in muscle. So bandwidths between 1 and 20 uh, hertz. Next. Uh, so uh, we'll show you uh, one of the actuators uh, oscillating at 1 hertz. And 
there's a uh, square wave uh, oscillation. Now if we can go down to the 10 hertz. <clears throat> uh, so that is now uh, equivalent to fast skeletal muscle. Uh, that's a bilayer, and if we can now go to the lower one here, you'll see a linear actuator contracting and uh, causing a, a small arm to move. So we've got a cantilever there. And so what you see there is this material here, fabricated in our laboratory. We put a voltage across it, it contracts, and we're driving that cantilever there. Next slide, please. Uh, so the active stresses we're achieving here are uh, remarkably high. We've achieved uh, in the order of 30 uh, megapascals. Uh, next. The strains we achieve are typically 4 or 5%, but we've achieved up to 18%. Next. And power to mass is also uh, uh, moderately high and expected to be much greater. Next. Uh, and the efficiency also is uh, surprisingly high. It's about equivalent to muscle. Next. And we're working to uh, produce over the summer uh, a complete reflex loop containing actuator, sensor, uh, simple uh, computation to create a closed loop servo system, servo controlling uh, the actuator with respect to strain. Uh, that, if you like, is the first building block. The, the reflex loop is the first building block in nature. Next. So uh, it's, it's our objective to produce uh, in the form of the nanowalker, uh, a form of the nanowalker at some point incorporating this technology. Next. So when we look uh, to the future, we are uh, expecting probably in about two or three years to start replacing some of the uh, more traditional technologies we have in the nanowalker with some of these biomimetic materials. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, we fabricate these ourselves, by the way, and we're working very hard on creating a three-dimensional fabrication system uh, to co-fabricate the actuators, the transistors, the sensors, the energy storage delivery, and so on, to co-fabricate them together. Um, one of the ironies here is that it may indeed turn out that we use the nanowalker, the existing nanowalker, as the technology for creating the uh, future nano walkers out of these new materials. Yes. Well, when you have a, uh, if you're talking about uh, uh, how many cycles we can go through um, for, for these devices, or do you mean if we look out in the future to? Well, we're seeing these as direct competitors with silicon-based MEMS technology. Uh, silicon is a great technology for manip manipulating information but terrible for manipulating energy. You can't, uh, the, the capacitors you implement in silicon have very low energy density. The electrostatic actuators are very weak. Uh, so here we have a technology with an extraordinarily powerful actuator technology, uh, very high energy density supercapacitors. Uh, so we can not only manipulate information, albeit at low bandwidths, but we can manipulate energy. And that really uh, puts us uh, way ahead of silicon if you want to both manipulate energy, uh, information as well as energy, which of course is what biological systems do. Other questions? I'd just like to make a comment, which is I think that this work shows very uh, clearly how if you're operating at very small scales, so micro scale and the nano scale, that the trade-offs, you cannot move information without moving energy around, and you cannot Make energy, make energetic processes happen without moving information around as well. And these two things are combined with each other in a way at the micro scale, in which in a way that they're not at the macro scale, where you can essentially completely decouple information processing from energetics. It actually reminds me almost 
when you get down to this small scale, it's, it's almost as if you're returning to having a car with a, um, well, an engine with a mechanical governing, right? The information uh, processing uh, uh, parts of the system are themselves mechanical. So you actually have to look very carefully at the trade-offs between information and energy when you're at the small In scale. In fact, I'd make a very fast point here. Uh, it's by no means clear to us that we necessarily want to use the uh, transistor for, uh, uh, for manipulating information. There's no reason here why we couldn't conceive of building a mechanical computer. Uh, because if you look at the uh, energy involved in moving the polymers, um, uh, there are some situations where you compute lower energies than is currently used to flip a gate in silicon-based technology. And I'll remind you that when the actin myosin crossbridge in your muscle moves, it's consuming about 10 to the minus 20 joules in making that step. So if you think of that as potentially a mechanical computer, uh, it's about uh, 10 to the 7 fold less energy in moving that molecule than current silicon technology uh, consumes in flipping a gate in a fast uh, CPU. One other comment. Your early work was about the nanosurgery, I, I described it. And this is obviously something that is might want to do this, but at least in your mind for nanosurgery. Is that one of your Yes. One of, and I know we're getting out of time here. Well, very yes. rapidly, one of our challenges over the next year is to get these things to be able to move upside down. And when a fly moves upside down, it's actually creating chemical bonds with the surface. It's got a controllable stickiness. And we would like something similar here so that we could move around upside down. And we also want to be able to crawl around on tissue. So it's not clear whether we would do that with a sticky surface or like uh, some insects, we just impinge in a little bit on the stratum cornea or on the surface of the skin. We don't feel it uh, to sort of uh, uh, move around. But yes, for, uh, medical applications are one of the areas. Great. Let's thank our speaker again. Our next, our next speaker is uh, Joe Jacobson. Joe, Joe is an assistant professor at the Media Lab, and we're very lucky in mechanical engineering that he's considered also to be half-time in mechanical engineering. Um, I was very happy about this because, in fact, one of the things that Joe works on, in addition to what he's going to tell you about today, is quantum computing. Uh, so, uh, but today he's going to tell you about fabrication of more conventional, but still very unconventional computing devices. Okay. Uh, actually, can I, it, am I uh, audible from here? Yeah. Could we uh, mic it? Do you want a mic? Yes. If, if you want me to have one. Let's mic Okay, it's, uh, it's a great uh, pleasure and honor uh, to be here. Uh, and I want to just tell you a little bit about some of the technologies we're developing to build uh, computers and other devices that we associate with the information age um, in new ways. And uh, pictured up here is a uh, kind of uh, cartoonish figure of, of what we envision the fab of the future to be. And basically, if you can imagine uh, a little desktop uh, printer, a little desktop device, and you download from the web, uh, say, a design for a Pentium 3, and uh, press a button, and out comes working uh, Pentium 3. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we're uh, doing this uh, in a minute. More broadly, what we're interested in doing is enabling the manufacture of uh, information devices um, in, a, in a way that uh, hasn't really fully been brought to the fore, which is continuous uh, manufacturing, uh, as opposed to really making things one at a time. And this is kind of a list of some of the things that we've demonstrated to date. Uh, in terms of being able to make on roll-to-roll -roll processes and uh, continuous processes, what we would call printable technology. And for each of these, we've actually had to develop completely new chemistries or completely novel chemistries or ways of doing things in order to uh, reach the point that we're interested in doing. Obviously, as uh, Ian eloquently uh, laid out, we need new ways to make logic and new ways to make uh, uh, computation. And this is true uh, not just for cost uh, reasons, not just to make things on flexible plastic, as I'll show you in a minute, 
but we really want to make new types of architectures, new topologies that are not enabled by current fab uh, techniques. Specifically, the ability to go very high device counts and to go to very high uh, interconnect counts between devices in a way that is not possible today. Secondly, in order to have universal logic, obviously we need memory in addition to logic. Uh, then there's some other things that we as humans like to have, for instance, display. We like to uh, be able to visualize uh, some of the information uh, buried in the computation that we're carrying out. And then finally, and appropriate for mechanical engineering, of course, is the ability to do uh, microelectromechanical systems. Uh, in this case, we've called this PEMS, which are printed electromechanical systems. I'll show you some very early examples of that. Okay, so I very briefly, this is some older work that we've done, but I'll, I'll just put up uh, one or two slides. Uh, we were interested in how to build a display in a completely new way, basically by printing. And the standard route to making displays, liquid crystal displays, as you may know, is very similar to the way we make chips. The cost of a fab, a Gen 3 fab, for making LCD displays is uh, in excess of a uh, billion and a half dollars. And displays are made roughly a couple at a time. These days, about four uh, or six uh, displays at a time on large pieces of glass. And our question was how we could go from that to actually being able to print uh, a little machine onto a surface that would act as um, act as a display, and not only any display, but actually uh, get us to the best properties that, 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 that we thought theoretically could be achieved, meaning uh, the lowest uh, current draw, a purely field effect material, if you will. Liquid crystal display, as you may know, needs to be driven with a alternating or an AC current uh, in order to prevent ion migration. We wanted something that was purely a field effect, something that would draw a few nanoamps per square centimeter. And so what we came up with is a very simple system, extraordinarily simple system. We have a little microcapsule that we create using uh, a bulk chemistry and interfacial polymerization that captures inside of it some nanoparticles. And these nanoparticles have surface groups that have been appended to them. And these surface groups are covalently bond to those nanoparticles. And they impart to each particle roughly about 10 electrons worth of charge. And then if we put an external field here, we can simply flip these position of these little particles vis-a-vis uh, -vis your eye and create a display. And if you keep distances small enough and so forth, you can actually get things to go pretty quickly. This is a very early uh, video of this. And uh, I hope it's, uh, I hope it's not too dark. Um, so this is uh, going to be a lens system that's going to go below the surface. And in the next frame, so this is some of this ink that we've coated onto a piece of plastic in this case. And now we're applying a 1 hertz uh, pulse or 1 hertz uh, waveform to this. And in the next uh, couple frames, you can see what I mean by printing a little machine. We, we, the, the motion of this is actually like a little cat's iris. And it turns out that if you stop the electric field, you can stop that cat's iris uh, just about anywhere that you want along that cycle, so uh, of any opening. And so you can make uh, different uh, images appear. As I said, this is a very uh, kind of early system. Um, and you can see uh, some imperfections in that. We've, we've gotten a lot better in the chemistry that we've been able to create. And here's just a, a little example. The size of these uh, microparticles? Well, the, the, the external capsule, uh, the, the, typically the smallest capsule that we create here is about 10 microns or so. And the internal nanoparticles are about uh, 100 nanometers or so, depending on which, which color we're interested in. An, an important aspect uh, is, is shown here. And you can see that it's really the electric field that defines the image as opposed to these capsules. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the most recent picture. But in, in most recent chemistries, these capsules, when they go down onto a surface, actually close pack and, and self-assemble into close packed arrays. Their, their chemistry is conformable enough that it can actually tile the surface. And then it's really the electric field, as you can see here, that defines the image as opposed to uh, the capsule placement, for instance. So this is an extraordinarily inexpensive way 
uh, to make uh, displays of very large size. The other property that I should mention, it, 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 as I alluded to, is if you remove the electric field completely, then the image will just stay there. And so you have this aspect of, of bi-stability. This is just a, a test device uh, showing resolutions of about 100 dpi or so. And the best resolutions we've achieved are in excess of 250 dpi. That just shows some of the, the thickness and so forth. So this is the front end, the visual end of, of devices that we might want to make. And then, of course, we need to be able to make logic and, uh, and computation um, in, the, in the background. And so what we were interested in is taking as a, uh, taking as a starting point the ability to make uh, an information appliance like a laptop, for instance. And there's actually several different hierarchies of logic that we require there. So if you think about the display, again, a liquid crystal display in, uh, in a laptop, the backplane, uh, the so-called TFT, or the thin film transistor backplane, doesn't need to be extraordinarily good. It needs to have uh, mobilities uh, of about one centimeter squared per volt second, which is achievable by using amorphous silicon. So all of the transistors, the million transistors on the back of your glass, can be so-called amorphous silicon or amorphous silicon quality. Then when you think about what's driving all of those pixels, those are the drivers, and those need to be a little bit better. Typically, we'd like to be polysilicon. Those are about 100 times as fast or need to be about 100 times as fast. Then, of course, we have a CPU, which we want to be the best that it can be. And these days, that's about a gigahertz. And to get there, we need to use single crystal silicon, and in the future, uh, we need to go beyond that to, to uh, materials like silicon germanium. And then, of course, uh, if you have an RF modem, for instance, uh, at 5.6 gigahertz, um, then you're already using uh, a heterogeneous semiconductor like silicon germanium. So we have this entire hierarchy, and what we were interested in doing is enabling the ability to make all of those logic devices uh, by printing, but to enable that entire hierarchy up to very fast speeds. So we wanted a single technology that could get us all the way from low speeds up to very high speeds. In fact, speeds in principle faster than you could do with a single uh, semiconductor like silicon. So in order to do that, the, the best materials that we know of obviously are inorganic uh, materials. These are materials that are processed in a normal fab. Now I should mention that when you, tip, when you, when you process uh, a pentium, uh, the time to process that pentium is, is long. Typically, you start with, say, a 12-inch wafer that goes into the fab. And as a very minimum, uh, you're talking about two weeks of 24-hour a day, seven day a week processing before pentiums emerge from that. You have on the order of 49 or 50 mask counts. Each mask. The wafer goes into vacuum, comes out of vacuum, gets a CMP uh, polish step, and so forth. And there are just an extraordinary number of steps involved in that. And so our question was, can we get there without doing any lithography at all? But being careful that the final product that we deliver is indistinguishable to you from what comes out of the fab. So what we developed was a chemistry that we published last year in Science where for the first time we took, we were able to create nanoclusters. These are clusters that have about 80 atoms of an inorganic semiconductor in them. And then to put on the apices of that nanocluster what we call leaving groups or organic groups that can self-assemble these clusters. Once they're self-assembled onto a surface, those organic groups pop off and create a single crystalline film. And this is, this is really the key to being able to liquid process uh, transistors or print transistors which are indistinguishable at the end of the day from what comes out of a fab. So actually, it's not really possible to, to view the si these clusters with conventional TE TEMs. Their size is on the order uh, of a nanometer or so. Um, these are some, these are some uh, nanoclusters which are a little bit bigger than this. 
one key that I, that I really haven't mentioned is, is the fact that each of those clusters has to be, really for this to work, has to be of an exact size. Um, you, you need a monitor dispersed distribution. But at any rate, when we take this material and put it down onto a surface, as mentioned, uh, and so here's a little crystal model of, of this for a 2.6 semiconductor. Uh, as mentioned, when they come down onto a surface, hundreds of these clusters come together. Their organic group pops off, and they uh, form uh, crystalline sheets here out of which we can build uh, transistors. And really the remarkable thing, at least that we thought when, when we first saw this, was that the clusters don't come together in an arbitrary orientation, but actually all of their crystal planes line up, which of course is the key to making uh, high quality uh, devices. So here are some of the first devices uh, that we made. And these, these, th these very first devices uh, were already the, ver the, the best by, by uh, more than an order of magnitude of any kind of transistor that people have ever uh, printed. And the first, as far as we know, printed inorganic uh, transistors. And so the other thing that I should mention is that once that crystalline plane comes together, uh, it can, it, it, it's the same material as came out of a fab. We've done all types of uh, backscatter electron surface probes and, and volumetric probes. And, and as far as we can tell, there's no organic content left. And so these materials can withstand very high temperature after the first printing. So how do we take some of that material and, and start to print it? Or, or how well can we do when we start to print this? And so this is uh, not, uh, this, this turns out to be pretty straightforward. We can take some of these materials. And, and really, the magic is, is in the material in terms of its ability to come together. And we can take some, some printing blocks, not these particular ones, but ones that have uh, patterns on them that are appropriate for transistors. And we've made, uh, to, at this point, we've made every component uh, inside of uh, a full-up chip, uh, including capacitors, uh, resistors. In fact, the aspect ratio of resistors that we can make is, is huge. I'll show you in a second. We can print down to 200 nanometers. And we can print resistors that just go for several inches uh, un, unbroken uh, with that resolution. Yeah. When, when, you, uh, when you print the lines in the yeah. self-assembly process, Crystal, yeah. presumably there's some shrinkage of, at, the, uh, at the edges. So I was wondering at what scale, what kind of accuracy you can get the edges of these uh, lines down. Yeah, the, the, the edge result, I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show you some data yeah, in, a, in a second. OK, so actually, here's some single layered structures. And here's, here's some structures that are a few microns. We can print uh, captured structures. Uh, we, one very important aspect, which I'll show you in a second, is the ability to print vias, uh, because you want to be able to go from layer to layer to layer without any lithographic step. Uh, here's some 200 nanometer uh, structures. Uh, we've done recently some 100 nanometer structures. And so the, the, uh, the uh, integrity of the, uh, of the line, uh, we, we can build working devices at, at 200 nanometers with full insulation between lines. Um, the integrity of the line is, is probably good to at least 50 nanometers. OK, so one very important aspect that I want to point out and that we've, we've pointed out at, at a recent conference is our ability to print multilayer structures, the self-planarization property of this chemistry. And that's extraordinarily important. Uh, we've actually printed, using some, some other technology, a very large number of layers. Uh, in fact, as many as 400 layers or so. And the, the real difference between this and, say, vacuum deposition is vacuum deposition of a material like silicon is conformal. It drapes over every structure you have. For that reason, you need to remove it from vacuum and do a CMP polish step. This technology, this chemistry, is self-planarizing self to a very good degree. And so we can simply print multi-stack structures uh, without having to do any etch step um, between layers. And that, that's a very important property for being able to build three-dimensional uh, structures and logic. Here are just some more uh, printed transistors. And recently, we've printed uh, with our 2.6 with our materials. You can also print uh, photoconductor arrays and so forth. 
or I should say phototransistor arrays. Okay, so here's, here's just a, a last uh, thing. I haven't really been specific about what substrate we're printing on, but many people are interested in being able to have transistors that are on flexible substrates, like pieces of plastic and so forth. And so uh, lots of the work that we do is on thin plastic films. Um, and you can imagine having little displays that you can roll up, put in your pocket, and so forth. And our hope is, is to be able to have a technology that's cheap enough that these transistors are actually disposable. They can perform some function for some brief period of time, and then you can dispose them. This is a set of ring oscillators. Actually, each one of these is, is several hundred transistors. OK, so uh, I'm not sure what my, my time is like. I have four minutes. OK. Uh, let, me, uh, let me just briefly, um, th these are some work we've done in RFID tags. Let me briefly just talk about our work in printing little machines. And this is in a very uh, kind of early stage. This is some uh, results that we just presented at IEEE MEMS in uh, Tokyo in January. Basic idea is to use the same chemistry. Uh, in this case, um, we're just showing that we can uh, put this into an inkjet head. And so these are, this is a nearly conventional inkjet head. And we can print out the same kind of self-assembling chemistry onto a surface. And again, we're going to print out multiple layers uh, to create some function. Uh, in this case, we've created, this is a six layer uh, printing. And uh, my apologies here. Let's see if any of these. Uh, So this is a little linear drive motor. We're actually interested in making some little microfluidic chips uh, by printing. And in this case, we have some little nanoparticles that we're uh, binning into different bins. And you can imagine that on each one of these bins, they uh, carry out some chemical reaction. And this is a way to uh, create the same kinds of steps that you might have uh, on the bench top where you take a beaker and pour it into this beaker, and this beaker goes into this beaker, and so forth. Um, but again, what we're interested in here is something that we've printed, flexible, and disposable. Okay, so if this will let me out. OK, the, the other thing I want to say is that, as you probably are aware, the same limitation that I mentioned in terms of creating three-dimensional structures in silicon in a standard fab for logic also applies to MEMS. Uh, the very best in the world is, is work uh, done at Sandia National Labs, five layers of silicon, which is really extraordinary machines. Uh, but because of that, we really think when we're building MEMS in, mostly in terms of two-dimensional structures. About the simplest structure we can build is, is a heat weighter, where we have a higher current density in this arm than in this arm. This was built by a student of mine using conventional silicon techniques. So typically, we're thinking about building horizontal or uh, structures in the plane. Uh, the functioning of this is, is very straightforward. You just put a current through this. Current density is higher here than here. And you can get this thing to, to move. OK, so one of the prospects of using this kind of chemistry that I mentioned is the ability to go up into the three dimension, up into the third dimension, and build vertical structures. And so. Here we've built, this is by inkjet printing. Now, the reason this looks like it's floating in midair is we first printed a release layer. And then we printed a, uh, a heat weighter. And this is a different heat weighter than, than people have made before. It's, it's a vertical heat weighter where you have 40 layers here and 140 layers here. So this is been built up out of plane. This is an example where we've printed 140 uh, different layers. That's another, uh, that's another view of it. Um, one reason you might be interested in inkjet manufacturing of MEMS is to cover large surfaces like airplane wings and, and so forth. This is a very crude version uh, before we really had our, our printing technology uh, down. But you can see if we put a little current into this, we can, we can make those things go. And now uh, my student is making uh, large uh, arrays of these uh, devices. So uh, with those uh, couple of comments, I'll end. Thanks very much.
What, what frequency can you get on something like that heat waiter? Uh, that heat waiter, um, the best frequencies we've gotten are not particularly fast. They're on the order of uh, 10 hertz or so. But, uh, well, if, if th that's built by inkjet, and so our resolution is, is really limited there. Um, the Q of the materials that we can put down, actually, that those are made from metal nanoclusters, so the Q is not as high. We're now making them by with semiconductor nanoclusters, and we, we think we should be able to get up into you know, typical MEMS that should be indifferent from MEMS, so 10 kilohertz, those kinds of range, over you know, 25 to 50 micron displacements. Okay. Yeah. Um, at one point, you talked about one nanometer particles. Yes. Uh, mono dispersed. That's right. And what were the source of those? Uh, our laboratory is the source of those. Uh, we, we developed a chemistry. Um, we developed a uh, we developed a chemistry for uh, synthesizing particles at that uh, at that size. And um, are they inorganic particles? They are inorganic particles that have organic capping groups. That's right. It's probably sure. different as you go over yeah. the media lab and see their, yeah. their lab. It's great. Not all the media lab is oh, not so entirely uh, smart Lego sets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are there other questions? Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Let's thank our speaker again. Um, <clears throat> our next speaker is George Marmis Tapas. Um, George is one of the newest members of our department, um, and he exemplifies what Nam Su said yesterday uh, about the strength of our department in optics. Um, optics at MIT, at any rate, have traditionally not been localized in any department. There have been great people all over the place, though perhaps the research lab for electronics has been one of the strongest places. However, now I think it's very fair to say, given the recent hires that we've had, that we now have the strongest optics group at MIT by considerably. Um, and that, as you see, I think that one of the things that we've seen is that uh, over the past couple of days is that optical methods are really key for doing lots of the instrumentation and manipulation at small scales. There's really not, you can't beat a photon for getting information from here to there. Um, <clears throat> unless, of course, you wanted to walk along a muscle fiber, as Ian was suggesting. Then, I, you know, then today's is great, too. Um, anyway, George is going to tell us today about uh, uh, optical imaging in three and in four dimensions. Four dimensions, wow. Thank you. That's space that. time. Uh, color and space, actually. <laughs> All right, so. Um, so, uh, I guess it's great to, to succeed the speakers like Ian and Joe because a lot of the things that they said sort of sets the pace for my talk as well. So uh, uh, let me first outline what I'm going to talk about. Uh, first of all, I'll talk a little bit about uh, optics, vision, and information, and what is the relevance between information and optics. And then I'll talk a little bit about what I do. So since I'll talk about it in detail, let me not uh, go through it now. Uh, at the end, uh, last night I made a, a one slide on uh, educational initiatives in the optics area, because yesterday there were quite a few questions about how we would deal with information education, mechanical engineering, and then we'll conclude. All right, so, um, so optics has been a very exciting field, and uh, in fact it's also a very old field. So uh, if you look at here, you would calculate that it's about, you know, about 3,000 years old that people started realizing that light is very important because that's how we see and that's how uh, we can also do other things like set things on fire and so on and so forth. So uh, they figured it out and they started working on how to use light and how to understand light. Um, yet, even though it's such an old field, uh, it seems to always be exciting because every once in a while a new discovery happens and you know, that sets up a new revolution. And this seems to keep happening. So let me go through very briefly some historical uh, uh, facts. So uh, apparently the first recorded uh, use of light for information was by the ancient Egyptians who uh, knew apparently that uh, light rays travel in straight lines, so they used this fact to measure the radius of the Earth by looking at sunlight through a well of some sort. So let me go through this, like a high school exercise. Uh, so I'll not go through this, but um, uh, uh, so this was quite, a, quite some time ago. Uh, then uh, uh, 
uh, ancient Greeks uh, knew geometry very well. They also knew uh, about the properties of light as it refracts through glasses. So they've developed uh, things like lenses and so on, you know, very crude things. And I think at the same time the Chinese, or perhaps earlier, the Chinese uh, developed similar things. But uh, the only thing is that, you know, Greeks had better recording methods and also they were more open. So we can actually tell what was going on. So in any case, out of all this, I picked an example that was the precursor to the strategic defense initiative that uh, President Reagan uh, <laughs> put forth in the 80s. In any case, uh, my compatriot Archimedes, he, he figured out how, how to use giant parabolic mirrors in order to take sunlight and focus it on uh, enemy sails. So he set enemy ship on fire. The enemy in that case was the Romans. So that was, uh, I guess, the first military application of optics. <clears throat> Anyways, so then uh, the sort of the Middle Ages came through and like all other sciences, optics disappeared. Uh, and then it recovered uh, shortly after the Renaissance. And, uh, you know, Newton, I guess, uh, he was working on everything. So he did develop a, th a theory of light, which was based on the fact that light is a particle. At the same time, uh, another fellow, Huygens, he developed a wave theory of light. And the two were, you know, fighting. Well, Newton won that fight because he happened to be the good boy of the establishment. He was actually a chaired professor at Cambridge. So, you know, that, that had very significant, that had a lot of significance in the outcome of that fight. In any case, um, then, you know, uh, for, for uh, a few hundred years later, people realized that the wave theory is also correct, even though the sort of particle theory also seems to be correct. Yeah. Newton also cleverly waited until Huygens died before he published his book. Oh, is that true? I didn't know that. There's another way to get it. Okay. Hmm. Well, make a note of that. <laughs> anyway, so, so in any case, um, uh, Young observed interference of light, so that it was clear that light is a wave. And then Maxwell uh, actually saw that light is essentially an electromagnetic field, so then the wave nature was not in doubt. But of course, the duality remained unexplained until people developed quantum mechanics. And then, as Seth was saying yesterday, wave particle duality actually did get explained in a very nice way. But quantum mechanics did not only achieve that. The fact that uh, people started thinking about light as particles and discrete energy, energy levels and so on, uh, it led to the development of several optical devices. Okay, before I get to those, let me, let me uh, show an example where optics was enabling for a fundamental advance in physics. Uh, you may know that uh, people before Einstein, they didn't know how fields are transformed. So they didn't know, for example, how can the gravity from the sun affect the Earth so that the Earth is stuck to rotate around the sun. So they were uh, hypothesizing ether and all kinds of strange things. Uh, then optics uh, allowed, uh, uh, Michelson invented an interferometer and he used optics in order to show that this ether theory was actually incorrect. And this is actually I'm not sure if what I'm saying is totally true, but probably it was a big stimulation for Einstein to develop special relativity. So, you know, so far optics has been kind of a, kind of a, a mean to, it, to, to itself to develop, uh, you know, optical devices. Yet here we see optics enabling a fundamental advance in physics, actually one of the major advances in this century. Um, now, in addition, Einstein, he was a very smart fellow, so he worked on other things as well. So he developed the theory of spontaneous emission, which was used later, let's jump one bullet here, which was used later, uh, I'm sorry, which was used later in order for the invention of the laser. So believe it or not, Einstein was instrumental in that, uh, yet it was a physicist, Town, who actually came up with the idea for a microwave oscillator. Oops, I hope we didn't die here. There we go. Okay, so he called it Maser, and a few years later he actually figured out that the same can work for light, the same idea, and then the laser was uh, developed, was invented. Uh, actually, I should probably go through these figures. This guy, this is Archimedes, this is Newton. Uh, this guy here is Maxwell, Einstein, everybody knows him. Then Towns is this fellow here. These two guys are two instrumental figures in quantum mechanics. This is Planck on the left and Schrodinger in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> him or him? Oh, the left. <laughs> Do you want me to elaborate on that? <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, in fact, Towns actually, uh, after he invented the laser, he became a member of the MIT faculty and he was the provost for a few years. Uh, I didn't know that actually. Did you know that? Uh, I found it when I was reading his Nobel uh, biography. Anyways. Yeah. Right, yeah. So um, now, amazingly, before the laser was invented, 
There was a, a Hungarian fellow in England working for, uh, I believe it was Oxford, but correct me if I'm wrong, uh, who invented the technique to, to uh, which he called holography, which actually um, allowed uh, the simultaneous recording of uh, amplitude and phase of the light. So, of course, at the time, lasers did not exist, so the phase of the light was not a very well-defined um, uh, thing. But, so, Gabor in, uh, originally um, uh, 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 pictured microwaves as the domain for application of his technique. But, of course, once the, once the laser was invented, then holography all of a sudden became a big deal. Uh, so that's my favorite bullet because, first of all, I work in holography and also Gabor was awarded the, the Nobel Prize in 1971, which is the year that I was born. All right. So, and the, the, the advances actually have been continuing. Uh, optics has been used for a tremendous range of applications, which I will go through in the next slide, but also has been enabling very fundamental advances in science. For example, you may have heard of Stephen Chu, which invented the something called optical tweezer, and Ian showed us an optical tweezer in the laboratory today. Anyways, Chu did this in the Bell Labs in 1983, and a few years later, he also won the Nobel Prize. Another fellow which I omitted shamefully is uh, Blombergen, who was a professor at Harvard uh, right up the street, and um, he essentially developed nonlinear optics, which allow us to do fantastic things like very short pulses of the order of duration of femtoseconds and, and uh, to study very unusual light matter interactions that otherwise are not possible, and he also won the Nobel Prize in the 80s, I believe. All right, so I hope that the only reason I put up this slide and I spent a, a big chunk of my talk on it is to emphasize how optics and information trade a uh, sort of a play even in a fundamental level, fundamental science. Now, science is a lot of fun, but um, what, what about applications in life where, you know, optics can change the life of people? Well, nowadays, well, of course, the field is now called optical engineering, right? It's actually making things using light instead of only studying things. So I will not repeat yesterday's uh, that physicists only talk about things. I'll just say that physicists only study things because I'm a little bit of a physicist myself. All right. So, okay. So, but now let's, let's see what optics can do to change society. So, uh, I sort of classified applications of optics into four major categories, and uh, I put some uh, examples for each one of those. Now, those of you who invest in the stock market know that uh, if a company has optics in their name or their description, it's a definite buy. So, the reason is because of communications. It's, uh, it's, uh, communications is the major application of engineering nowadays. It's not an understatement. And there are all these, all these optical devices that enable it. Of course, there is also wireless communications, which is a different field and is also very important and a very high growth area, but it's also electromagnetic. Anyways, so in the optics area, semiconductor lasers, fiber optics, optical routers, optical uh, devices to distribute optical signal, I mean, signals right now between major nodes, but very soon all the way down to your, uh, to your house, to your uh, uh, sidewalk. Uh, they're a big deal, and there's also even more advanced things like quantum communication that Seth was describing yesterday, which are also based on the use of optics. And of course, this is not commercial yet, but it could be in 10, 20 years, who knows. Another big application of, of optics is data storage. So you all have used the CDs and DVDs nowadays. You know how fantastic it is, the DVD, you can watch movies and listen to commentary and blah, blah, blah. There's magneto-optical discs which actually failed in the market but, market, but they remain. Holographic memories which try to compete for their, for their uh, space in the market. And all these technologies actually enable to uh, high capacity storage. Now, the most traditional application of optics is, of course, sensors. Uh, where by sensors, I mean everything that has to do with imaging, the classical telescopes, binoculars, microscopes, uh, digital cameras, analog cameras, uh, hybrid cameras, whatever. Um, there's other sort of more exotic uh, things, like displacement sensors, which can be used, again, for a number of measurements, pressure, uh, you know, um, uh, deflection, and so on and so forth. And some of these are very classical. Interferometers have been known since young, in the 17th century. There's a more recent developed the atomic force microscope, which is based on uh, optical measurement of displacement and so on and so forth. And uh, so these are sort of general areas of application, but there's also the biomedical, which is nowadays one of, again, one of the major uh, application areas for actually any kind of engineering. And we have all kinds of fiber optic endoscopes, optical coherence tomography, confocal microscopy, and so on and so forth for diagnostics and discovery. Finally, uh, 
last but not least, is displays. Yet another area where optics, uh, optics has been traditionally very important. Probably the first display was a device called Camera Oscura, which is actually a very nasty thing. It's probably the first spying device. It allows you to look into the remote area. If you put the lenses appropriately, the remote area just gets imaged somewhere in your room, so you can spy on people across the street or something. Um, in any case, nowadays uh, uh, we have liquid crystal projectors. Like, is it liquid crystal or MEMS? Does anyone know? Anyways, so people use liquid crystals and MEMS to make projectors, like this one. Uh, we have virtual reality displays that are based again on optics. Laser shows, and uh, probably the most important is uh, the use of lasers to process materials. So you could do very traditional things like material welding, material, uh, you know, uh, combining materials and so on. But you can also do lithography, as Papkin uh, Del Toro was telling us yesterday. The reason we have computers and transistors and so on and so forth is optical lithography. There's no doubt about it. Well, Joe is trying to change all that, but so far this is what we have. And of course, laser surgery is another big deal. All right. Let me tell you a little bit of the things that I do uh, in the optical engineering lab at MIT. Uh, first of all, I should tell you that uh, my background is here. My background is in optical memories. But, uh, well, after I came here, I figured I should, I should do something else to just keep my interest alive. So I spread out into all these areas. Uh, so right now, I'm uh, working very heavily in communications. My, uh, sort of my most recent project is uh, uh, how to fabricate something called photonic band gap materials. Now, you probably have not heard of what a photonic band gap is, but let me tell you that it's a class of uh, the materials that allow you to do very strange things with light. I mean, one of the things that you can do is you can have like light make a 90 degree turn without losing any of it. So you can have light turn 90 degrees and 100% of the light energy actually does turn. So unfortunately, all these fantastic things so far happen only in the computers of, uh, of uh, sim in simulations. Uh, so we're working in my lab on actually how making it happen for real. So we're very excited about that. Uh, we also jumped into the optical communications, uh, I don't know how to call it, bandwagon. So we have uh, some activity on optical MEMS. We're making actually a wavelength uh, router using optical MEMS, and this is con in collaboration with the uh, Microtechnology Lab and Marty Schmidt. Um, a core of my activity is on sensors and imaging. Uh, so I have, a, uh, I have a project called Collective Vision, which is about equipping a very large number of robots with uh, an equal number of very cheap, very individually stupid sensors. Now, when I say, how can a camera be stupid? Well, uh, if you look at the camera, your camcorder, it has 640 by 480 pixels or some, something like that. Now, try to look through a camera with 10 by 10 pixels, you will actually see nothing. So that's what I call a stupid camera. Yet, if you put all these cameras together, all these little stupid cameras, it turns out that you can get a very high resolution image of the environment nevertheless. And even more, if you distribute the sensors appropriately, say, in this room, you can get a three-dimensional picture of the environment where your noses actually can stick out in the image, this kind of thing. And um, um, so we're working on uh, how to adapt the sensors and make, them, um, and make them get the best images given the circumstances. And we're also working on visual learning on how, how we can use this information to train systems to artificial systems to perform something. Now, the something that the systems we develop are performing is pretty horrible, actually. We're working for the Air Force, so what they want us to do is locate targets. And, well, I will let you imagine what they do with the targets. But in any case, there's a, a great deal of commercial applications for this technology. For example, in entertainment, you could imagine mounting these sensors on the legs of uh, soccer players or basketball players. And as the players move through the field, you can actually use the information returned by the sensors in order to reconstruct the game in 3D. So then, you know, you are sitting then in your virtual reality room and you actually feel as if you were in the basketball court. These are the kinds of commercial applications that could get enabled by this technology. All right, let me not take too, much, too long. Um, the thing that I will actually talk about today is uh, another kind of imaging, which I call four-dimensional imaging. And uh, I call it so because uh, we're trying to image volumes. So uh, by volume, I mean really X, Y, Z, the same kind of image that you get from MRI, for example. And in addition, spectrum. So we're trying to image the color of light. Now you say, well, why, how is this different than a camera or perhaps two cameras? Well, here's the difference. If you have one camera, first of all, you get a planar projection, 
of space, so that's 2D, and also the camera does not get real color information. It just gets red, green, and blue. RGB. Real color information would really give you the, the intensity, the relative intensity as a function of wavelength. So it's really a new dimension. Now, um, like every instrument, uh, it, it uh, needs for an application. Uh, being at MIT, we found a fantastic one. Some colleagues in cognitive science, they're interested in uh, building, uh, in making cultures of neurons. So, you know, what they do is they cut up the brain of a mouse and they take a slice of neurons, they put them on a chip, and then they activate it electrically. So there's a strong need in order to monitor the dynamics of these neurons. We would like to actually be able to monitor their activity, and this is what the sensor will be doing. So uh, we're very excited about that. We're also working on interferometric surface metrology uh, with applications such as corneal topography, measuring the shape of your eye, and so on and so forth. But again, I will not have time to talk about it. All right, let me motivate a little bit why we want 3D and 4D vision. First of all, there's no doubt that we're very strongly visual animals. We rely on vision very much, and the argument about it is that, you know, blind people are very severely handicapped, right? So, um, the, if you look at our brain, which is probably our most sophisticated uh, instrument that nature gave us, a very big part of it is devoted to vision. Um, uh, yet, the, the ability of our brain to to acquire the environment is still kind of handicapped. Why? Because the sensors that we have, it's only two of them, and they are, you know, pretty much like cameras. Very sophisticated cameras, you know, with very huge, uh, um, how you call it, um, dynamic range and so on and so forth, and very good resolution. Yet, if you look at this picture, you become very sever severely perplexed because this is actually an impossible picture. And the reason you get perplexed, okay, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a planar drawing and can look whatever it wants. Yet, your brain tries to interpret it in 3D, and you realize that it's impossible. And there's many, many other examples of illusions that show the deficiency of our brains to process 3D information, which is not inherent in our brain, in fact. It is just because of the limitations of the sensors that we have, the limitations of our eyes. So, biometric systems are good, but, uh, well, you know, when people were trying to make uh, airplanes, for many, many centuries, they were trying to imitate birds, and, you know, they kept falling, so they would fail. Well, at some point, they invented, uh, you know, jet engine and propellers, and then, you know, all of a sudden, planes became successful. Yet, planes still have, the, have wings. So, my point is that, you know, it's good to imitate nature, but up to some point, our ingenuity can actually overcome nature and perform better. Not because we're smarter than nature, but because nature perhaps didn't have the needs that we have developed for ourselves. Anyways, so... When we develop an imaging system, we actually try to develop sensors that can overcome the limitations of our eyes. So, at least this is what I do. So we try to develop sensors that can capture the environment in 3D and give us more information. Now, information is a key here, because if you think about it, what does an imaging system do? Well, it forms an image. But what is an image worth? An image is worth as much as many questions you can answer about the object. So the way I posed it, it refers exactly to the information that my system transfers between the object and the observer. And uh, the space where this transfer occurs can have several dimensions. The typical, your typical camera is two-dimensional plus this RGB color. Then you can think of various volumetric imaging techniques like, uh, you know, uh, tomography, uh, PET and MRI and all these things. You can think of 2D imaging spectroscopy, which is a very new field. You can actually buy these devices now, but you couldn't buy them three or four years ago. And uh, so that's N equals three. When you talk about imaging volume and spectrum at the same time, so now this is the generalization of this imaging spectroscopy to volumes, then we go into N equals four, a four-dimensional space. Now, people have been uh, working for a long time on uh, imaging techniques that allow you to resolve depth. How long do I have? Four uh, minutes. You actually only have, like, uh, you actually have like two minutes. Two minutes, oh. All right, so I'll take, okay. I figured four minutes is the standard for, for. <laughs> I should have asked two minutes later. Everybody else just have to ask four minutes before you. Thank you. All right, so I will accelerate a bit. So, um, so triangulation is essentially the way we use to figure depth. Now, triangulation is very nice, but it limits you to imaging surface objects, opaque objects. If you can actually look through objects, then triangulation won't work. I mean, it will work, but it will give you very poor results. 
So there's other techniques like coherence imaging, which I will not talk into, but if you look at the system here, you realize that there's no lens. So it's a very strange imaging technique that still, believe me, it still works. Many people are doing it and yet does not use any lenses at all. There's confocal microscopy, which fortunately my colleague Peter uh, and uh, neighbor and friend, he talked uh, yesterday, so uh, I don't have to, to, to explain it. Now, the, the point is that um, if you look at traditional optical systems where you have a train of lenses and at the back you have either the retina of the viewer or a piece of film, then actually we're actually helpless. There's no way to do depth imaging. What we can do is we can augment optical systems with, well, guess what, information technology, with computers. And so all the, all the systems that I showed before, triangulation, interf interferometry, and, uh, and uh, confocal microscopy, they're based on the fact that the image information is collected by a computer and then post-processed in order to acquire the volume. All right, let me skip that one. The, uh, I was just going to say that the reason I did all this is because as a kid I loved Star Wars, so I wanted to develop things that, you know, can be like R2-D2. So I'm not doing exactly that, I'm just doing the revision, but anyways. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the tools that I'm using. What I use is something called volume holograms. Now, most of you know what a hologram is. You see them in displays at airports, museums, and so on. In fact, the best display in the world is just one block down the street, down Mass Avenue, if you go to the MIT Museum, which I believe is open on Sunday, you can see the best collection of holograms in the world. Uh, most of those made by my colleague in the Media Lab, Stephen Benton. Okay, so the person here is the inventor of holography, Dennis Gabor, ne sitting next to his hologram. Now, the holograms that Gabor invented, uh, they're known as thin holograms, at least now we call them thin holograms. And uh, we call them so well because they're thin, only a few optical wavelengths thick, and their property is that if you rotate your point of view, the image also rotates, and as a result, you get a different perspective. So the hologram appears to be 3D. And in fact, you know, because you have two eyes, each eye looks at a different angle, so therefore you, you, you have the illusion that the image you construct is three-dimensional. Well, the volume holograms do not have this advantage. Well, when you illuminate it at the correct angle, then you get the reconstruction to come out. When you tilt the angle a little bit, you get nothing to come out. So this sounds like a serious handicap, but it does enable you to do something. It does enable you to use the hologram as a ma matched filter. And let me explain what I mean by matched filter. Let's say that the hologram is recorded by a very simple optical wave, a point source. So you take the point source, you pass it through a lens, you collimate it, and then you use a reference wave on top so the two interfere inside the volume, like a little cube, and they form a hologram. Well, now, as I said before, if the hologram is reconstructed by the appropriate angle, which in this case is horizontal, then it will actually diffract a very significant amount of light. And we call this Bragg matching. So that's fine. However, if we defocus the point that we reconstruct the hologram, then all kinds of new angular components get into the picture. Now, the central one still reconstructs light, but the off-axis components do not. And therefore, you can, you, what the hologram does is discard a point source that has been defocused. So, so that's, that's the, the basic property that we use in order to, to, to utilize holograms as imaging elements. So if you compare a focused point source and an out-of-focused point source, the focused point source makes it through, the out-of-focused point source does not make it through. So this now becomes a little bit reminiscent to a confocal microscope that Peter was describing yesterday, where if, uh, you put a pinhole in order to pass a, po a focused point source through the system, but when the point source is out of focus, then the pinhole discards it. So the hologram does actually the operation of a pinhole, and we call it the Bragg pinhole. All right. Let me, let me point out a couple of things. First of all, match filtering is better. I will only take 30 seconds. <laughs> so uh, match filtering is better because it is actually suit, suits the propagation of light better. The problem is that 3D scanning is still required, so in a sense the, the, the operation of this device is still as a confocal microscope, and one of the potential problems is that uh, the hologram does not diffract all the light that comes through. You lose a little bit of light, uh, so then uh, you, know, you realize that this could be a problem. Uh, yet now who can make holograms that at around 100%, perhaps 95 or 90%, so that's not a problem anymore. Let me not go through the details. This is a kind of image that you get using this, device, this, uh, this imaging device. This is a piece of wafer where there was a small trench, and the trench appears black here. Why? Because the trench was out of focus, therefore it did not give signal in the detector. Uh, the trench, you know, the surface gives a high signal because it is in focus, and so on and so forth. Let me go, not to go through those, it's very interesting, but um, 
but I don't have time. Now, what we're working on right now is to generalize this technique in order to acquire spectral and volumetric information. So why do we want to do this? Is in order to be able to image uh, fluorescent tags, which allow us to monitor various biological effects. So the effects could be either applied fields that change the spectrum, the fluorescent spectrum, or it could be deformations, or it could be chemical reactions, or whatever. But this way we can monitor neurons, we can make on monitor proteins reacting, and so on. And we can do it simultaneously in volume and space. So again, I don't have time to get into the details. I'll just tell you that this happens through a volume hologram recorded and set up in an appropriate way with a little bit of auxiliary optics down here. What it allows us to do is image resolution volumes well, now the volume is in 4D, so it has dx, delta x, delta y, delta z, and delta lambda. So we need to come up with a name of this. The 2D name is pixel, the 3D name is voxel. We didn't have a 4D name, so we invented texel. So it allows us to image texels that are as big as 1 micron by 1 micron by 1 micron in space and 1 nanometer in wavelength, so that's pretty good. And um, we can also do this in one shot, so different slices of the object get mapped into detectors simultaneously. And I will not say anything else because um, my friend Seth here will have a heart attack, so, so I'll spare you. <laughs> uh, okay, so I finished my research talk. Uh, if, I, if I may, let me go through very briefly through the curriculum changes that we made for optics. Okay. I keep... <laughs> Uh, in fact, there's a reason I did this like uh, last night uh, urgently because um, uh, it's a very important question. All these things, uh, all these uh, techniques are very new. And in fact, they are new not only in mechanical engineering, but also in other fields, even physicists uh, sometimes falter in, this, in these things. So it's very important to, pro to provide the students with a set of classes that introduce them in the, pre in the proper way. And again, I'm going to refer to Papke and Deltorosian yesterday, who said that, well, you know, within three weeks in his freshman year, he learned enough geometric optics to do lithography. But a lot of things, unfortunately, or fortunately, actually, because they keep us in business, but the unfortunate thing is that geometric optics is not enough. So, you know, the students need to learn a little bit more. Okay, so optics has been slowly creeping in into undergraduate curriculum. We have this introductory measurement instrumentation class where uh, we have been developing uh, at least one new optics experiment and we plan to sort of uh, make it a permanent one because in this class the experiments change with every time but in any case we plan to make this permanent. There's a proposal that is uh, circulating now among the faculty to re-engineer our entire instrumentation sequence. So 671 is the first one, and then we have 672, there's a proposal to add a new one, 2673, and if this happens, there will be enough uh, room to put more optics experiments, and not only sort of mundane things like interferometry, but also more spectacular things like atomic force microscopy and so on. Now, there's a very extended list of graduate courses, uh, 2717, uh, will be offered as a regular course starting next year. It has been offered as a special course, uh, course for a while. Uh, there's an optical imaging class that uh, Peter saw is offering this spring. Uh, Ian Hunter and Forbes Dewey, they both offer advanced instrumentation classes which are not optics oriented but they contain optics experiments. So that's the difference. The first two are actually optics uh, centered whereas the others have optics sort of in passing. And um, this summer we initiated also a summer professional class, which I will not say anything more, otherwise I'll, I'll sound like a salesman. And at last I finished. Thank you. <laughs>